from uh, Houston, Texas. Um, I'm a partner in Redinium NPC. Our office has been established in 1997. Um, we do exclusively business immigration. Along with me is Emily Newman. Emily? Hi, thanks for joining today. My name is Emily Newman. I'm a partner with Ready and Newman PC, and I'm also the writer behind the blog ImmigrationGirl.com, where I provide practical information from the desk of an immigration attorney. So there's lots going on in the news about immigration these days. Seems like that's been the top subject since uh, Trump was elected. Yeah. So, kind of, what topics are we going to be covering today? Today, we're going to be covering in the is the day one CPT curricular practice training legal uh, updates about the H4 EAD. We're going to also discuss about the options if the H1B has been rejected. Uh, we're going to discuss about is regular processing better than premium processing or premium processing better than regular processing. We're going to discuss about whether STEM extension people can work at third party location. And we're all going to also going to discuss about the September 11th USCIS uh, policy memo, which is becoming on September 11th, whether they are going to issue denials without the RFE. Emily, the first question that I want to face is that do you consider the day one CPTs as legal or is it not legal what what is it um, there is also some people that are accusing that it's made up by the immigration lawyers that the day one cpt is legal but some of the lawyers are making out for their benefit that the day one cpt is not legal can you explain is day one cpt curricular practice training legal and if it's not legal why it's not legal why is that when the universities are approving the i-20s with the day one cpt why, if you disagree with that, day one CPT is not legal? Why is that you're contradicting the US, uh, uh, the universities? Yeah, I think there's two issues with these day one CPT schools. Uh, the first is, can CPT be issued from the first day? Um, the regulation is quite clear that you should be a graduate student for at least one year before you can be authorized for CPT. That's the base requirement, is you have to be in school for one year before you're authorized. Now, how are we getting all of these day one CPT programs then? There is an exception to that rule that says that if your particular program requires immediate participation in training, then it can be allowed before you meet the one-year requirement. So that doesn't necessarily mean day one, um, and it has to be a, a required part of your program. Now, I feel some of these schools are making up a program and saying it's required in order to authorize this employment from the beginning. Now, who are the types of people that are using these day one CPTs? Is it people who are coming to the United States on the first time for their F1 and no. going through a master's program? No, it's people who already have a master's degree, didn't get selected in the H1B lottery, so their next option is, what else can I do to keep working? You notice I didn't say what else I can do to keep studying. Mm -hmm. It's what else can I do to well, keep I working. Thought, I thought uh, going to school is for studying, not for working. Exactly, that's the point. So these day one CPT schools are allowing people to work full-time jobs and then study on the side, which is exactly opposite of the purpose of the F-1 visa. So that's why I think um, from the start, these kind of day one CPTs are problematic. They may not be um, authorized, even though DSOs are authorizing them. There's a second issue that comes up with CPT, and that is kind of a changed interpretation in the regulations that talk about how much time you can spend in all types of practical training. So the regulation says basically that if you've graduated with a master's degree and then you use up 12 months of your OPT or use all of your OPT time, in order to get more practical training, it doesn't specify which type, it just says more practical training, you have to go up a degree level. So you're not supposed to get another round of practical training when you go back to school at the same degree level. So these schools are giving a second master's uh, for people who've already received a master's specifically for the purpose of work, not the purpose of study. And I think that is the problem uh, behind these schools, and that's why we're seeing so much scrutiny from USCIS on their applications. 
Okay, have you, have you seen any denials where the people have applied from CPT to H-1B and their status got denied because they got the day one CPT? Yes. Or is it just that you're making it up? No, we, in the past two years, um, so we have not received any decisions on this issue in this year's quota yet. We do have RFEs on the issue, but for people that filed last year and the year before, we received many change of status denials where we tried to argue that the CPT was authorized and USCIS disagreed and said that it was a violation of status, therefore um, you're not eligible for the change of status. Emily, then if the CPT is not legal, why are the university issuing? Do you see a pattern of only certain universities belong to a certain state issuing? Or do you see that universities like University of Texas at Austin, Harvard University, and Stanford, are they issuing the day one CPTs? Is only a particular set of universities which you doubt them that they should not be issuing their issue. Right. Yeah, I've never heard of someone getting day one CPT from Harvard, from U of M, UT, any typical um, universities that you and I have gone through. exactly um, so the schools that are giving this you know I'm not going to name names but I can tell you there's probably a handful that every single time I see a request for evidence on CPT I know it's one of those schools and that it's always the case every time I do a consultation with someone who's asking me well I'm thinking about going back to school for another master's because I didn't get selected what do you think about this school? It's always that same school or a couple of schools. So it's very limited number of schools that I think created these programs for purposes of making money off from international students who didn't get selected in the lottery. And then I think so they're all coming from one state, uh, Kansas, mm. mostly. Uh, and some in Missouri, but mostly in Kansas is where they are coming from. Um, any updates on the H-4 EAD? Uh, you have said, uh, we have said before that in June the proposed regulations are coming that might have some restrictions on the H-4 EAD, may eliminate on the H-4 EAD. Is the H-4 EAD allowed right now? Is there any update? Um, e can they file the extensions of the H-4 EADs right now? Yeah, so the H-4 EAD still around, still everything's 100% the same. You can still file a new one, you can still file extensions, no issues with getting an H-4 EAD today. On top of that, the proposal that we were expecting in June didn't come in June, it didn't come in July, and it looks like it's probably not going to come in August either because it still has not been given to the OMB for review. That review generally takes a good 30 days. I just checked it five minutes before we started. There is no proposal um, f regarding the H-4 EAD under review at the OMB. So it seems like it's being delayed. We knew it was going to be delayed. That was um, part of the court case that's been ongoing. The Trump administration gave their update to the court saying, yes, we still intend to proceed with this new rulemaking, but it is delayed. They didn't say why. My guess would be that they're trying to bolster their reasoning behind uh, rescinding the rule, given that they've been, um, there's been a lot of pushback from the courts on TPS um, ending, on DACA ending, DACA on ending. the travel ban. So I think they're probably trying to bolster their arguments as to why they feel it's necessary to rescind the rule so that when they do finally do it, um, when it goes to court, because you know it will, they'll at least have some leg to stand on. Emily, with regards to the options now, in until 2016, we used to see very less H-1B denials. I mean, it was kind of rare event that we used to have a H-1B denial. Now I see a lot of consultations every single day coming to our office uh, requesting what to do when they got the denial. Uh, there are a couple of s different situations where the H-1B gets denied um, where the person, what options do the person has? Um, so I'm going to go through one at a time so that uh, uh, our audiences can understand the issues much better. If the person has, is being transferring from company A to company B and the company A's I-94 has expired, he joined company B and the company B's transfer got denied what options are left and if there are any alternative options what are the risks involved in those alternative options right so the day after that transfer is denied you're immediately out of status and immediately accruing unlawful presence 
uh, because the I-94 from the previous employer has already expired, Although while it was pending, while the transfer was pending, you were in a period of authorized stay, unlawful presence was told, you had the work authorization to work for the new employer. As soon as it's denied, you have to stop working, you have no status, and you're unlawfully present. Um, given that we have a soon to come NTA policy where USCIS is planning when they issue these denials when the person is no longer lawfully present, they will then go to a next step and put you into removal proceedings. Um, I think that the best option generally is going to be to exit the country and then try again either with a new employer or same employer by filing an H-1B requesting consular processing. Would they be subject to the cap because they went to India, they are filing the consular processing. Right. So because they've already held H-1B status in the past, this is assuming they were for a, a, a cap subject employer before, they don't have to go through the lottery again. So the denial doesn't make you not counted anymore. So you can immediately file a new petition, cap exempt any time of year. You don't have to do it only in April. You can file it in premium processing, request consular processing. As soon as it's approved, you apply for your new visa stamp and come back and you're back in H-1B status. Now, in the same scenario, if the I-94 with the company A, through which he was working through, and uh, the company B, he moves to company B, but the I-94 is valid, what options would they have? Well, the only difference there is when the denial happens with company B, it does put you out of status. You have to stop working for company B, but you're not yet unlawfully present because your I-94 is not expired. So one option may be to go back to company A, if they'll allow it, and continue working for that company, that way you can maintain your status from there. Um, you could try uh, refiling a transfer or filing a new transfer to another company potentially within 60 days because you have that I-94 validity, um, but there's a good likelihood that your transfer might get a, the H-1 approval without a new I-94 card, meaning you're still going to have to exit, go for stamping, and come back in order to get back into status. Emily, uh, one of the things is in the situation where the transfer, you have explained it very clearly. What is the situation where the person is working for a company A, his I-94 validity is expiring in, let's say, November of 2018, and his extension got denied right now. What are the options there? That's a good situation to be in, minus what? the denial part. <laughs> denial. <laughs> um, okay. This person was smart. They filed their extension well in advance. They probably filed it in premium, premium processing, processing, which means that if something goes wrong, when they get the denial, because their underlying petition has not yet expired, it's still good till November, they can simply file the extension again if they can overcome the reasons for denial. So they can continue working based on the approved until petition November until of November, file an extension again, they can file a transfer, they can file a change of status. You have so many options simply because you filed early enough so that if a negative result comes, you have time to make other plans and have a backup plan. In the same scenario where he's extending the H-1B with company A to company B, I'm sorry, extending the, the H-1B from company A, the I-94 expired, now we have the denial. What are the options there? So then you're back in very similar to the first situation. As soon as the H-1B is denied, if the I-94 has already expired, you're immediately out of status, immediately unlawfully present, best option you have is typically going to be to exit the country to avoid this new NTA policy, file a new petition, again, you're not subject to the cap, file it in consular processing, you can do premium processing, get the approval, go for stamping, come back and regain your status. I'm going to put you in trouble, Emily. Uh -oh. You said that it's a good situation that you got the denial. And you said that the employer was nice to file in premium processing. Is it, isn't it that if you file in premium processing, the chances of the denials are high? Is that true? No, it's not the premium processing that causes the denial. It's the petition itself would have been denied even if it was in regular processing. I personally file lots of petitions in premium processing this day and age is probably 90% of my filings are in premium because I recommend it to my clients and they follow my advice usually. Um, and it just, 
there, there are a lot of benefits to it. Uh, number one, you get the answer faster, so you never get to the point where your I-94 is expiring and now you've got a denial. You're not going to get to unlawful presence. You're not going to get to the NTA. On top of it, because you're paying for this extra service, you have, not you personally as the employee, but the employer or their attorney has a little bit of more communication with the service center who's actually working on the case. So to give you an example, uh, just this last week, we had uh, an H-1B petition that was denied and we felt it was a completely wrong denial. Mm -hmm. Just 100%, we've never had a denial like that before. It seemed not correct at all. Because it was a premium processing case, we were actually able to email the premium processing unit, request supervisor review, explain why we thought the denial was completely wrong, and in three days, they turned around, reversed the decision, and approved it for a three-year extension. So practically the chances of denial is quite less in premium processing than that of the regular processing because when you want to go to the supervisor in regular processing, that might be months before we get the attention. And the guy loses a project, there's no purpose for us to reverse the decision because there's no project. So the chances of, um, of, of getting the things in a proper way, in your way, in premium processing is much higher than that of the regular processing. Whoever has been advising you that the premium processing is not good, please do not listen to them at all. Third-party location working on the STEM extension, Emily. Now, there is a quite contradiction in what the uh, Department of Homeland Security has stored in 2016 and the USCIS, which works under the Department of Homeland Security. USCIS, as you know, quietly updated the website in January of 2018 that the STEM extension person cannot work at third-party location. Now, the DHS in the 2016, they clearly mentioned it that you can work at third party location. Whom do you listen to right now? Some of the lawyers, including us and other people, have said in 2016, yeah, we don't see any issue in working at third party location. And the eyes, which is Immigration Custom Enforcement, said you cannot, you can work at third party location in 2016. Now USCIS is coming and telling, no. Mm -hmm. You can't work at third party location. You will be uh, you will be considered to be out of status if you work in. Whom do we believe right now? What is the situation? And if there is an RFE in the H1B, what is the solution? Yeah, it's really difficult because these are two agencies both under Homeland Security and they're saying the exact opposite thing. So which one is the one you follow? Um, generally, F1, student visa, all of that is maintained by ICE. So you would think that ICE, ICE. would have the ultimate decision-making authority. ICE in. is Immigration Customs Enforcement. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they decide what is a status violation. They're the ones that monitor the SEVIS system. Um, they can see what's uploaded in that SCVP portal uh, for the students. So ICE should be the one issuing the regulations. They are the ones that issued the STEM OPT regulations. That being said, USCIS is the one that's actually adjudicating the benefit. So when you file the I-765 for your STEM extension, it's USCIS that has to make the decision. When you file your change of status from F1 with the STEM OPT to H-1B, it's USCIS that's making that decision. So USDIS is the one that updated their website saying, no, we don't think this is um, possible to work at a third party site. Since that happened, ICE has not made any announcements, nothing publicly. Um, they've not updated any of their guidance. So we really don't know yet how this is all going to play out. On top of it all, the website update is kind of contradictory to the actual regulations that created the STEM OPT. Mm -hmm. The regulations simply say you have to have a bona fide employer. Well, now USCIS is saying that by bona fide, we mean you, ha you have to be on site with your actual employer to receive this training, which is well beyond what the actual regulation says. Now, what do you do if you're facing this situation where you're on your STEM OPT, you've been working at a third party site, 
Um, where, where does the issue come up? Number one is typically in the H-1B uh, change of status request. You'll receive a request for evidence asking you um, how you've maintained your status since you were working at a third party site when the USCIS website says you can't. So we are seeing quite a few of those um, in our H-1B filings. Now what can you do once you're in that situation? Um, number one, you can certainly fight it. You can make the argument that it, this is beyond what the regulations say. This is, uh, ICE should be the one making these uh, updates. How can you change the law by a website update? There's all these arguments you can make but at the same time, it's a USCIS officer that's going to be adjudicating the application, and so they're very likely to rely on the USCIS guidance. They're less likely, I think, to look at the ICE guidance or anything so else. So, wh what's the solution there. when we get an RFE for the H-1B um, challenging the uh, employee working at a particular third-party charity location, what is the solution for it now? Yeah, so if you're now since, since they can't undo what, have, what, what was done. Right, yeah, so if you're in that situation and you don't want to take the risk of arguing your case, one option would be to change your filing from a change of status request to a consular processing request. So when you file a H-1B petition requesting consular processing, you're not required to submit any documentation of your maintenance of status if you're already in the U.S. Consular processing is typically used for people who are outside the U.S. So it makes sense someone outside the U.S. is never going to be submitting proof that they've maintained their status since they're not in the U.S. to maintain a status. So um, one option if you are facing that type of RFE, uh, speak with your attorney definitely to figure out what is the best plan for you, but you could change your petition from a change of status to consular processing so that you don't have to um, prove that you've maintained your status. You can continue your F1 status and once the H-1B petition is approved at some point in the future when you're ready to have it kick in, you exit the country, go for a visa interview for H-1B stamping, and then come back to the U.S. in H-1B. And there's never a determination made that you violated your F-1 status in that situation. Before I want you to go to questions, one of the thing is ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, says something under the Department of Homeland Security website uh, that is in 2016. A lot of lawyers said, yes, you probably can. In 2018, January, they said no, and now this all this is really confusing whether you can or you cannot. Um, but my advice is what you have done, you cannot undo it. If you possibly can work at your employer location, I would strictly tell you to go and do it. If you can't, you may want to discuss with your lawyer because uh, 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 coming August 9th, there's a new memo that is coming in, you might want to be, uh, you might want to consider that memo, which we're going to address it more thoroughly in my, you know, next uh, live Facebook on that. But if you are working at third party site, you may want to consult a lawyer to see what your strategies are. Um, yeah, this is definitely something not to play around with at this point because we have this unlawful presence memo coming up, because we have the NTA memo expected to come up, even though it's temporarily on hold. Um, it makes these decisions very uh, consequential. So meaning that if you cho make the wrong decision, you could end up unlawfully present and in removal proceedings when, uh, when you don't need to be. So this is something to take incredibly seriously. If you have one of these types of requests for evidence, definitely consult with your attorney. Any questions from Facebook Live, Emily? Uh, let's see. I have an H-1B extension filed in 240 days, ending in 45 days. Still no response from USA. I don't understand why you didn't do premium processing. I don't waste your time coming into this Facebook Live. Please go and file the premium processing. You should be getting the results before 45 days. Please don't trust any person who are telling that premium processing tends to have more RFEs and more denials. Yeah, um, and on that topic, so, now that we have this new memo on unlawful presence, we have a cup upcoming memo on NTAs. We have the September 11th 
um, memo on denials without this is Trump it all. So there are a lot of things you can do to avoid the impact of these memos. Number one, if you are needing to file an extension, start working on it seven months before it expires and make sure you get it filed as early as possible. You can file it up to six months before it's expiring. So don't wait until a month before your I-94 is expiring to file your extension. Assume that there's going to be a request for evidence. But in addition, so file early, file in premium, and also with this new RFE memo coming out, make sure that you are filing the best petition possible. I see, I see a lot of people or a lot of companies that kind of, well, let's just file it and then we'll deal with the RFE later. Well, we might not get that RFE anymore. So when you're filing, you need to make sure you're filing the best possible petition you can. Put your best foot forward so that if there's a question, you will get that request for evidence. If you're just filing with missing documents or not not f putting everything together properly, after September 11th, you may end up with a straight denial and no opportunity to, um, to respond to a request for evidence. Most of the questions seems to be the same ones that we, you have answered, Emily. Um, one thing is that I'm on H4 EAD. Uh, I have used up my six years of H1B. Can I now file the uh, labor and I-140 and can I get the H-1B back? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, you mean to say on H-4EAD you can file the labor and exactly. I-140? Exactly, yes. Okay. So you don't have to be in H-1B status to have be sponsored for a labor certification. You can be in any status um, or outside the country. So yes, the, an employer, if you're on your H-4EAD, your employer can sponsor you for a labor certification, I-140. Once that I-140 is approved, you can file a change of status back to H-1B to request an extension beyond the six years using your newly approved I-140. Oh, one of the Facebook person is, uh, uh, is reminding us that uh, we need to address the issue of the September 11th memo. Uh, and he's telling, what are the mandatory documents list? Um, to file a H-1B where they won't reject it without issuing an RFE. As you know, Emily, that on September 11th, on or after we filed any application, if there are not enough documentation, the USCIS is not under obligation to issue an RFE they can deny. Now, in that, what are the mandatory uh, documents and what are the documents that are options? Sure, and this comes from the I-129 form instructions, so you can always find it yourself. It's publicly available on USCIS website. Um, but typically you're looking at all the I-129 forms, all the pages of that, uh, the complete LCA, and some sort of employer letter that states how this job is a specialty occupation, um, some sort of documentation relating to the employer-employee relationship, whether that's an employment agreement or an offer letter. Um, if your job needs a license, you have to submit the license at the time of filing. Don't wait for an RFE for it. Um, and if you're requesting an extension of stay or a change of status, you have to provide documentation that you're maintaining your current status. Those are all listed as required initial evidence in the I-129 uh, form instructions. So if you're filing without any of those, you can expect a straight denial without a chance to submit new documents. One of the patron is asking that the RFE deadline, if it falls on the weekend, we still have three days to respond. Is it true? No. You don't have three days to do it. Let me tell you one thing. Don't play at the edge of a knife. You can always be cut at any point of time. If the deadline is on Sunday, please, don't look forward to respond to it on Monday. Try to respond to it 10 days before, 20 days before. Don't go to the edge of a knife. No, it's not three days afterwards. And if you want to know the true answer, I would like to speak with you personally, or you better contact a lawyer personally and have an appointment to get that answer. Why do all these things? Why spend the money for a lawyer for doing it? Just try to respond early. All right. Um, we had a question about what's the process for downgrading from EB2 to EB3. First of all, why would someone want to do that and how do you do it? As Emily, uh, have, we have seen that EB3 prior to date movement is going forward 
compared to EB2. The movement is very fast. We have also seen, seen the same thing in Chinese nationals. EB3 is forward in some point of time than compared to EB2. That's the reason why these people are questioning, can I do an EB3 conversion? Do I need to file a labor certification again? If you have an EB2 labor and I-140 approved, to convert EB3 and EB2, you don't have to file another labor certification. You can directly use the same labor certification to file an I-140 application. Now, having said that, though there is one caveat here is that when you file the EB3, you may not be able to do premium processing. I have seen in situations like that where the USCIS has rejected their premium processing because when we are filing an EB3 application, we don't file the original labor certification because that original labor certification was already submitted in EB2 application. So that's the only hindrance. So do you at this point of time, is it, is it advisable for you to convert into EB2 into EB3? Or do you wait for the priority date to move and convert at that point of time because the I-140 will take a long time? My, my suggestion to the people who wants to convert is that, I mean, you don't need to do it right now, but when the time comes in, you can file with the same labor certification an I-140 for EB-3, and you can file the 485 at the same time, even though that I-140 is not approved. You can use that to file the 485. So I'm not in a hurry at this point of time in converting EB-2s into EB-3s, uh, but I will do it when the time comes you can convert it. Now, as I said, EB2 can be converted to EB3. It's not easy to convert into EB3 into EB2. For that, there are a lot of mechanics that you need to look into. But for EB2 to EB3, it's a mostly a simple, yeah, a simple filing application. All right, Raja Saker had a good question. Is there a list somewhere of specialty occupations? How do we know when a job is a specialty occupation? Do they publish a list? They don't make things simple. <laughs> uh, in mathematics, there is a, a square plus b square. Uh, a, a, a plus b whole square is called a square plus b square plus 2ab. I mean, I'm sorry, Ms. Parity, I'm not a math student. Uh, in law, it doesn't work that clearly. They ha always have a gray area, and there are some things which are not clear. Yes, there is a SOC code uh, that is there that you can look into the Department of Labor website. Uh, does it give a clear guidance? What is approval? What is not approval? No. It's riddled with all buts and ifs, what the job title is, what the job description is, what the end client is telling, what the, the, what, what the, uh, what the employer is telling, and what the position requirement are for that particular industry. And also, you know, it, it considers a lot of different factors. What is this person's education? So it's not like there is any magic word that we could give it to you that, OK, this title with this job description is going to be approved. That's not the way it works. It's a little bit more complex. You can look into SOC code, can guess which are better, uh, which are not better based on how much percentage of the people have uh, uh, requires bachelor's or master's degree. The uh, Department of Labor specifies that. But then again, Emily, if you look into last year, in August of 2017, they changed the definition of the system analyst. So all the people relied on filing H-1Bs, and the Labor Department changed the entire thing. So there is no clear thing where we could say, this is good, this is bad. It will be client specific, it will be employee specific, it will be the job specific. When you combine all those three things, the lawyer should be able to guess, a, a very educated guess he can do it at that point in time. Right. Yeah, Nancy, do, you, do you disagree on that? No, I yeah. totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Nancy has a good question. You know, If you've already received your H-1B approval, uh, you're working in-house, You know, there's not a lot of risk in the type of uh, job that you're doing, it's pretty clear, it's a specialty occupation, and you file your extension. Is there still a chance of denial? Or Which one? The, uh, an H-1 it. extension. So if you've already been approved for your H-1B three years ago, and now it's time to file your extension, is there a chance of denial if everything's exactly the same as what you filed three years ago? Yes. Nothing, whatever the USAI stood yesterday, they're not going to stand today. They're not going to stand for tomorrow. 
every time you file an application they are going to judge that application independently they did issue a notification that they are going to judge independently irrespective of if you have got the approval previously we have had seen cases where the people have got h1b approvals they got their extensions they got their second extension now at the third time third extension everything stands the same now they say that the position does not require a bachelor's degree so it's not a guarantee that uh, that it's going to uh, that it's going to go through just because you have done a couple of times before harsha has a uh, harsha vardhan has a good question now all these h1b's we are discussing emily these uh, extensions these amendments and all these things they could be simply avoided if one simple law which been supported by more than 300 congressmen that are supporting this which is hr392 what's the status of it is what are the probabilities for the approval right so we did finally have some positive movement on it uh, maybe a week or two ago so uh, just as a reminder, HR 392 would remove the per country cap on the green cards so that everybody's on an even playing field. We're looking at distributing green cards based on merit alone, not country of birth. Um, so this has been gaining co-sponsors by the minute, yet never brought to the floor for any kind of discussion, no debate, no, no forward movement on it for months and months and months. Um, now we had some positive movement to where during the Homeland Security Appropriations uh, Bill that's in the Judiciary Committee in the House, um, HR 392 was added to it as an amendment. So now we have it, and that was approved by the committee. And so we have several immigration well, amendments. A lot of Indian, ma Indian newspapers said it's already approved. Right. Yeah, what this was it? just in the committee. So once we get through this committee, there are several other committees that have to review this bill. Um, they can all add their amendments as well, and then they make their approvals. And then it goes to the full House uh, for a debate. Then the House has to pass it, then starts the Senate. We have to go through the same thing in the Senate. <coughs> the Senate passes their version of the bill. If it's different, then they're going to go into conference where they try to come up with uh, compromise. And so it still has a very long way to go. We don't know if ultimately the bill that Trump signs, assuming he doesn't shut down the government, um, will include HR 392. It's very possible it could be taken out at some point or might not end up in the final version of the bill that finally gets passed by both the House and the Senate. So it should be passed by both houses, not just the House of Representatives. It should also be passed in the Senate. We have had similar bills previously that were been passed either by the House or by the Senate, but didn't pass through both the things. Um, so there is possibility it could because it's a Department of Homeland Security appropriations maybe it could but uh, at this point of time you know the chances are not that high I would strongly recommend all the people to urge your congressmen to support the HR 392 bill because it will definitely di change the discrimination which which will not discriminate based on the country of birth um, just to give you a quick update on the H-1B lottery uh, progress of the cases that have been filed, I get a lot of questions on my blog about, you know, I, I got my receipt number, my, uh, my case was selected back in April, I'm putting in my receipt number and it just says it's cases received, nothing's happening. Is this normal? Yes, this is absolutely normal. I would say probably... Um, about 50% of all cases have actually been looked at by an officer. The other half are still pending. They're gonna be pending into September. Some are gonna be pending in October. Uh, same thing happened last year. So when I compared with last year, where we are at this time this year, we're actually slightly better. Mm -hmm. uh, so last year we had even fewer approvals and fewer RFEs at this point of time. The majority of our cases had not been touched in August last year. So this year things are moving a little bit faster, but still expect more requests for evidence, expect the processing times to be longer. Um, I think last year our final case that got approved didn't happen until April of this year, and that could absolutely happen again this year. Emily, what about the premium processing? When would that be installed for the new quota cases? Right, so when they um, 
I guess, announced that premium would not be available for the cap cases back in March, they indicated that it should become available again in September. So hopefully next month we'll have premium processing back. Um, especially if you're in the cap gap, you should definitely consider upgrading to premium processing because as a reminder, your cap gap ends on September 30th. If your H-1B has not been approved by that point, it's still pending, you must stop working. From that point, you go into your 60-day grace period. Um, so you want to make sure that your H-1B gets approved sometime, uh, preferably by October 1st so that you don't have any gaps in your employment authorization. But even if you aren't in cap gap, um, it is a good idea to upgrade to premium processing and get the process over with. I think what gets so many people into a bad situation is because they let things be pending so long till they get to a point where they're at a point of no return. There's no other options because they've waited so long and just let it be pending. Um, so if you're, again, if your extension is pending, you're getting close to 240 days, you should never get to that point. Upgrade it to premium, get it over with. Don't get into the situation where your denial happens after your I-94 expires. Don't get into a situation where now unlawful presence kicks in, now you're gonna get an NTA. File early, file in premium, get it over with. Partha has a question. Um, we have advised people not to travel when the H-1B is pending in the new quota. Uh, can I travel after October while the H-1B is still pending? No. Don't travel when the H-1B is pending. Don't travel when the H-1B is pending in quota. Don't travel when the H-1B is pending in amendment. Don't travel when the H-1B is pending in extension. Don't travel when the H-1B is pending with transfer. Once the H-1B is pending, you do not travel. No, under all circumstances. Emily, you said uh, about your blog. Uh, what's your blog? And I know that every news that comes up, the first thing that I look into is that, is this immigration girl, is she going to, uh, you know, I, the first news that I get it from you. Can you tell more about your blog and how to subscribe to that? So that, you know, we do weekly once uh, Facebook Live to update the things, but people would like to know the things much faster. Right, yeah, so my blog is at immigrationgirl.com and uh, if you go to that home page, there's a place where you can enter your email ad address to subscribe to the blog. So that way, anytime I post a new article, it's gonna automatically go straight to your inbox and you'll be able to see that immediately. Um, usually, I try to post about breaking news, important updates, it's all specific to employment-based immigration. Um, H1s, L1s, uh, OPT, F1, green card process, that's the whole blog is just about that, just for high skilled workers. Um, and we have a pretty um, good sized forum going on there where people ask questions um, at the bottom of each article and I do my best, I, I personally respond to every single one of them so I do my best to respond to as many as I can. Um, so if you have a question that we didn't get to here, you can always um, post it on my blog there. You can post it on Facebook here. You can post it on Twitter, at Immigration Girl uh, is where I'm at on Twitter. And we'll do our best to keep you updated. We try to give you the news without freaking you out. I think that's, <laughs> yeah. that's our goal. We give you the real news, not the fake news that's all the hype and that sort of thing. And then we're also, because we're getting too many questions and we, we think so that we are not addressing each topic separately, Emily and I have decided that we are going to make a session for each of the things separately. First, we're going to have it for August 9th memo, which is effective day after tomorrow. Uh, we're going to address that. We're going to address H4 EADs. We're going to address the STEM, third, uh, STEM extension third party location, CPTs, H1 RFEs, H1B denials. What, probably about 15, 20 different topics. We're going to make a video or Facebook Live, and we're going to release that. Um, so that you can watch at any point of time. We're going to have one topic and we're going to address that uh, clearly, questions and answers. So we're going to collect all the questions that are being posted in, the, in all different forums that you're putting in and we're going to ask the questions. And of course, we'll take the live questions too when we are going to present the each topic separately. Tomorrow, we're going to address the issue of the August 9th memo and the impact of that on the F1 students who are on CPT, STEM extension, OPT, and all, all the student visas that are available, we are going to address that. Going forward, we are going to address also all other topics that Emily and I are well-versed in. We're not going to address 
uh, the things that you know visas that we don't do deportations and certain other things uh, criminal aliens and all those things we don't represent that much so we don't have much knowledge but within the business immigration we have decided to address and have a separate video for each topic so that we can refer people if they have some questions they can go there but if you have any further questions and you want to speak with Emily me or any of our colleagues who are better than us or equally better than us um, you can make an appointment with them at rnlawgroup.com uh, thank you guys for tuning. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for joining. Thank you.